Good evening. Welcome uh, to SciArc tonight. I, I obviously am not uh, Eric Owen Moss. Um, I'm going to introduce Eric Owen Moss. He really doesn't need an introduction, but uh, I'm going to give him one in any case. My name is Michael Speaks. I'm the uh, director of the graduate program uh, here at SciArc. I want to welcome everybody uh, uh, from outside SciArc, uh, and uh, I want to welcome all of our students and faculty and local uh, SciArc uh, alumni and graduates. Um, as I said, Eric Moss obviously needs no introduction. Uh, he opened his office in 1973 in Los Angeles. Uh, he was educated at Berkeley and Harvard. He's recently held uh, professors at uh, professorships at Yale, Harvard, uh, and appointments in Copenhagen and Vienna, and in addition to SciArc, uh, where he's been teaching uh, since 1973. Um, I'm not exactly sure what Eric is going to talk about tonight. Uh, I suspect he's going to talk a lot about the work in Culver City. Um, I just did a, a piece uh, on Eric that I'm extremely uh, happy about, and uh, since uh, when you write a piece and you're extremely happy about it, you always want to read a little bit of it. I'm going to read just uh, uh, a few sentences from the introduction. Uh, it's really about uh, Eric Owen Moss as an urbanist, um, and I start the, the piece with a provocative statement that urbanist is perhaps the very last thing one might call Eric. Owen Moss. Uh, other people might call him other kinds of things. His architecture, like much of that produced by the so-called LA school, Frank Gehry, Frank Israel, Morphosis, uh, Michael Rotundi, is synonymous with formal inventiveness and painstaking attention to detail and materials. Though always influenced by the poetry of urban life, Moss has never seemed engaged with the economic, cultural, and political forces shaping the urban condition. Perhaps that is because those forces never had the magic of Paul Clay, the complexity of Joyce or Kafka, or the intrigue and mystery of the Martian moon Phobos. A trip to Culver City, the former industrial area adjoining Los Angeles on its western edge, will change your mind not only about Moss's architecture, but also about the relationship between design and urbanism. Slowly, the poetry of urban life is, be is being transformed into a force that is, in fact, shaping the urban condition. I'm sure we're going to see that, uh, and I suspect a lot of other things tonight. I hope you'll welcome me and uh, uh, welcome. Uh, if, I hope you will join me in welcoming Eric Owen Moss. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael Speaks. It's, uh, SciArc is a unique, SciArc is unique, SciArc is a unique place for me to speak. It's, it's a benchmark, really. There are probably two or three places in the world that have a particular personal meaning to me, that is institutions, to which I can return over a long period of time and I have a feeling that that as I watch SciArc the name is the same the place is somewhat different as I watch SciArc change and evolve and move SciArc is also watching me so we'll see what we see uh, first two please Architecture is two things, I think, simultaneously. Uh, and those two things are inextricably bound, and I want to both explain how they come together and how they're discrete or separate. Uh, the first is, before anybody gets up here and starts to yak and, and pontificate, and deliver theories and exegeses and, and all of that. Simply the experience of, of form and building and space, maybe the autonomous power of form or the poetry or the experience or the experiential 
or what I refer to in the Gnostic book, which I recommend to you, uh, as, as the lyric. So the lyric is what it is before any utterances start to displace it or to explain it or to account for it. The other side is a more intellectual side, the other aspect, and it has to do with, with the content or the meaning, the culture that it carries, the symbolism that it makes, and the associations that it connotes. And those issues are never resolved finally. They always remain in, in, a, kind of, in a kind of debate. So, uh, I'll refer to those as a dialectic. So there's an intellectual dialectic which goes on at the level of content or substance or idea. And there's the experience, the content of the building which comes first and maybe last, which is the poetry or the lyric. On the left, uh, this is probably a, a, a peculiar way to start the discussion, and yet it, it gets to a point that I think I, I start to come on to or to think about now. Relative to ideas of history and chronology and sequence and order and system that accounts for architecture over a period of time, Michael implied something about that when he recited a, a number of names of people and firms who had done work over a period of time and theoretically were the inheritors of previous work and the progenitors of, of following work and so on. Uh, we'll see if over a long period of time any of that method actually holds because what I wanted to suggest is this, this on the left is, is Chauvet. It's a cave in France near, uh, uh, near Marseille and if you don't know it, it's, it's in the lexicon of Lescaux and Altamira and, and, and those remarkable discoveries I guess of the Neolithic era. With, with astonishing work and, 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 as you can see, astonishing paint work. And on the right is uh, uh, our friend Picasso, 20,000 years later, uh, with, with sketches that led to the, to the famous painting, which was once in the Museum of Modern Art and now is in the Prado of, of Guernica. And I think what I wanted to suggest is if, if this were an art history discussion, somebody could start to account for the cave paintings in terms of, of Neolithic religious ideas or superstitions, all of that, and could explain the Picasso in terms of, of, of a discussion of, of, uh, of, the, of the war, of the Spanish Civil War. So there are clearly uh, substantial differences and substantial meanings. And I think what I wanted to say is what overrides those, those distinctions and may be more important is that they may be fundamentally very close to each other. I think the question is, are they fundamentally the same? Or are they fundamentally different? Are they part of a chronology that runs from 20,000 years to today? Or is it possible that the conception, which is so much a part of our lives, next thing, next thing, 60s, you're finished, 70s, forget about it, this is the 90s, see you later, the next millennium, and all of that, next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing. And in fact, that may be elusive or illusory. It's, it may not be so at all. And finally, the only thing there is over a long, long period of time are remarkable things. Remarkable and, and, and beautiful things. Next, please. On the left, uh, this is a map about 3,500 years old, the Babylonian map of the sky. Uh, and I, I wanted to use it to tie in with the previous remarks having to do with method and system and order and the need to develop that in order to understand notwithstanding the inadequacy, the consistent inadequacy of the systems that are developed. So that for these people who looked at the sky in wonder just as somebody else looked at a horse as magic, looked at the sky and tried to make a drawing 
which accounted for what it was and what it did and how it behaved. Because if you can do that, if you can do that, then you can say this is yesterday and this is how it was. And this is today and this is how it is. And this is tomorrow and this is how it will be. So it gives, it gives a method to the culture or an order to the culture and it locates the culture in the world. And this, this is a fundamental psychological need but the problem is that every one of these systems and every one of these drawings and every one of these methods and every one of these paradigms is ultimately wrong, incorrect, in, in, in many cases with very substantial omissions. So the point is, it seems to be needed psychologically, and yet it seems, in fact, always to come up short. Another example uh, on the right, which ties a little bit uh, into, into our friend who, who seems still to be prominent, Charles Darwin. And again, looking at the biological world and trying to understand it and trying to account for it as a method or an order or a system or a sequence or a chronology, all of that which makes things intelligible, which makes the world intelligible, without, with, without which everybody is a little bit lost. So it went from here, and then it went to here, and it went to here, and it always did that in a logical step, small step by small step over eons. What happens apparently in, in the investigation of, of the fossil world is th this chronology can't actually be represented it, with physical evidence. There are big gaps in the chronology. And therefore uh, comes the term, the missing link. There's some, the piece is always missing. And I think uh, what I wanted to suggest is that the missing link may be missing in perpetuity because there is no link at all, and it never was. And, the, and the, the, the method of movement may be not from X to Y to Z, but it may move by jumps and radical mutations. But to accommodate that psychologically seems to be very difficult for us. And I think in the end, the message is that architecture really is a prayer for order, just as these systems are. A prayer for order, but how it's answered, so this is a different question. Next. Uh, this is one of my heroes on the left, in case you don't recognize him. It's a painting that comes from the Uffizi, apparently, of Magellan. So this is the romance of architecture that certainly students and, and, and faculty at, at SciArc must share. I mean, the romance of adventure and discovery and investigation and innovation and all of that. Chasing over the face of the earth trying to understand what it was or what it might be. Uh, Magellan's, Magellan's adventure was the adventure of an extrovert looking at the external world. It may be that, that our problem is slightly different, not that there isn't an extroverted world still to explore, but it may be that our problem is, is a discovery or an investigation which is internal, is the investigation of the introvert. And the question, the question is really, I think, who is our Magellan? And slide on the right, this is what's liable to happen to you when you sail off into the unknown. Uh, next. Um, on, on the left, I, I, I think not so long ago I shared this discussion with, with Michael Speaks, but the, the book on the left, which is probably not so prominent in the United States, but would, is, is relatively new, I think it was published in 99, is prominent in France for certain reasons, in Germany for other reasons, but is, is a very detailed investigation, not by somebody on the right, but by an institute in France, uh, some of whose members were long-standing, in good standing, members of parties on the left. And it's, for me, another example, and especially in, in, in my lifetime, at my age, to, to watch and listen to 
advocacies of, of governments on the left, intellectuals and artists and painters, Auden and Spender and everybody, who, who for, for years and years saw this system as salvation, as, as the science of history, and history became a science, and where science would go, Hegel's paradigm, Marx's paradigm, and this is where it goes, and where did it really go? I think this is an enormous lesson for everyone. What, what this is, is a very, a very detailed discussion, the book, very detailed discussion of what happened in the Soviet Union, what happened with Mao Zedong and Cho and Lai, what happened with Paul Pot, what happened with Fidel, and, and, and all of that, a dispassionate discussion which says watch out watch out for allegiances and watch out for systems which purport to explain and prognosticate they don't they leave important things out and inevitably down they down they come and I, I don't know if you can read the caption um, which may be more important than than Starbucks in uh, Bangkok but now comes another another euphemism or another slogan or another line or another allegiance so you should be careful you don't sign up too quickly and this is globalization and whatever it means you probably hear it a lot whatever it means whatever it whatever it uh, whatever it portends it also is a discussion which tends to define the world in terms of relationships between economy mass mass numbers economy and technology and i think although it's very different it's not an ideology it doesn't have the intellectual veneer that the left had it also has some of the some of the terrible presumptions the flaws that were built into the to the advocacy of of, of communism that it understands the world in mass it understands the the world as collective it understands the world as uh, fundamentally economic and technological and that may not be so. Next. So be careful at Starbucks. Watch what you drink or smoke. Uh, on, on the left, uh, this, this is probably slightly more familiar ground, Miranetti uh, at the beginning of the century in, in Italy, the Italian futurist, and Condera. Uh, at the end of the century and again I, I for me this is important because it has to do with with ideas that that come into prominence and are dominant develop allegiances and 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 everybody is saying this must be so and this is the way the world runs so this is an advocacy of speed and the machine and hygiene and all that but wait a minute when we come to the end of this century it may be fast is not so fast or fast is really slow or fast omits something that that can only be understood when the movement is slow. This is not to say Miranetti had nothing to offer, and Marx had nothing to offer, and the Babylonians had nothing to offer, but that, that one has to retain an independence and a separation from these points of view, a critical point of view about these things, because in the end they can't possibly account for all of the issues. And I think in terms of the introverted Magellan argument, I think one has to one has to retain a separation and independence from these ideas in order to develop one's own point of view one's own paradigm one's own way of understanding next uh, and and in fact that has happened at least provisionally we put this this uh, book together uh, last year with uh, the infamous Gianfranco Monticelli and th this book Gnostic architecture is an is an attempt to to set down an advocacy which in some ways is contradictory to everything I said it, it, it's an attempt to put down something which is durable and durable in the sense that it outlives the changes in various ideas or various paradigms so it, it advocates what is really a provisional paradigm a provisional point of view a provisional way of understanding with conflicts which are intellectual and then it suggests that the way of overcoming that finally or reconciling the conflict intellectually is is 
poetically, is lyrically, that intellectual conflicts are perpetual, they're never resolved, and the resolution in architecture is only in the experience of the poetry. The book was actually, the book has, has five sections um, going from extrovert to introvert. Uh, the first section is called the outside of the outside, then the inside of the outside, and then there's a section called the glue, and then the outside of the inside and the inside of the inside. So there are those five pieces. And, and the books that, that some of you may be familiar with for one odd reason or another are associated with those five sections or with three of those sections. The first, the building code, uh, is the outside of the outside. The dictionary or the glue is the central section of the book. It's not a conventional dictionary, but it's a personal dictionary which has to do with associations and references that belong to me and my life, but, but in, in terms of my ad aspirations, can also be located in an audience like this. So they're not strictly private and idiosyncratic, but they belong to a general cultural discussion if they can be raised and, 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 and noticed. And then the last section uh, is, is uh, structured in a way which is related to, to a biblical form and, and, uh, and construction, which, which explains the inside of the inside. Next. Um, Michael mentioned Phobos, and I wanted to say a word about it in case you've missed it in your studies of the sky. Uh, Mars is the red planet, the god of war, uh, and Mars apparently has two companions. One is called Phobos and one is called Demos. They're two moons. And this is a photograph on your left of, of Phobos. And it interests me, I think, for several reasons. One, that, that I found it intriguing and raucous and, and beautiful. Uh, another is that, that it, it contradicts almost all of the accepted scientific models for form and behavior of bodies in the sky. They were all supposed to be spherical. This obviously isn't. They were supposed to rotate one way. This rotates the opposite way. It rotates retrograde. So again, in terms of, 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 uh, of uh, a way of understanding or a method or a system, now we find substantial exceptions. Uh, the other point has to do with, with its shape and what the shape might suggest because in a certain way we know the sphere and we can draw it and we can write an equation for it and we can build a model of it. It belongs to Euclid et al. This could be explained as pre-sphere or it could be explained as post-sphere. I don't know that it represents progress or regress, but it represents something different. So in one way, when you, when you look at this, it, it, might, it might indicate a movement toward the sphere, in other words, toward something we know and recognize in a historic sense, because a sphere is a piece of history, it's a shape we know. On the other hand, it might indicate movement away from that, movement in a different direction, movement away from the sphere, which is away from history in the sense that it's a movement towards something we don't yet know. And, and as I see it, and, and certainly conceivable others could see it differently, it holds both of those in a tension so that it suggests movement towards something which we know but it also might suggest movement away from something that we know, and it holds all of that together simultaneously. Next. In a slightly different frame of reference, I wanted, I wanted to say a word or two about, about city planning. And I was looking around for an image that, that, that communicated something slightly different. Uh, than, than I think the conventional vantage points on making a city. And the business with whether, American is whether an American is qualified to discuss soccer is uh, aside, uh, but the Brazilians and, and the Argentinians uh, pictured on the left represents a, a structure or an order or an organization. There is a method, there is a system, there is a chronology of moving the ball. There are 11 players on a side. 
as I understand it, and they have certain positions, as I understand it, but they move as if the field is microwaved. And there's so many nuances, and there's so many idiosyncrasies, and there's so many pieces that finally look like they weren't practiced and weren't anticipated, that there is an underlying order and system and method, and yet as you watch it, as, as you watch it evolve in front of your face, it looks almost accidental. It looks happenstance. It looks very free. And I think that quality is of interest to me, that it, that it would have a coherence somewhere whether you could find it or not, but the, the appearance of things, the, the, the visual, the aesthetic of things, would, would suggest a kind of freedom which is pulling away from that, but not so that, so that the, the order is utterly lost. And another, another image of that is actually a, a, a town in, in Morocco, and in, in an essay that we're doing for uh, the... Uh, for uh, David Morton now, for Rizzoli, there, there is a discussion of, of city planning in terms that, that I refer to as centripetal and centrifugal, pulling apart, pulling together, and the sense that however, however stable the world seems to be, however constant the city seems to be, it actually is moving together, changing, pulling apart. And not only is it important to know that, but it's important to, to help, to assist, to push it, to pull it, to look at it critically, to see what makes it go, to move something out of the way and to move something else in, centripetal and centrifugal in city planning. Next, please. The discussion of, of what Los Angeles is, uh, is wide-ranging. There's a lot of speculation on this subject over the last 15 or 20 years as uh, Los Angeles as a progenitor of cities of the future, how, it, how it's made, uh, how it's organized, what it cares about, what it neglects. And I, I, this, is, this is for me a, a, a useful image because I, in a certain way it suggests uh, and I, I think it's not my intention to disparage or to rip the city. I think finally the term city is probably not very helpful like most of these labels. But it seems to be more about big pieces of infrastructure, at least first, and buildings less importantly and maybe unimportantly. So the pieces of infrastructure organize the thing but the question is always, where do you go? I, there's, there's an old joke that, that uh, you get off the freeway in LA at the wrong place, and you get off the freeway in LA at the right place, and it doesn't make any difference. And, and uh, whether, whether, whether that's literally true, but it actually, it, it actually communicates something about infrastructure, which in some ways seems to, uh, to, to connect nowhere to nothing in a sense, so we can debate that, but let's say this is the hypothesis for the moment. And therefore, uh, as, this, is, this is a river for us, which is, which is a concrete structure, and a bridge, and a road, and, and power poles, and if you look carefully, aerials for, for radio, and, and, and television stations, and in and amongst that, another block of infrastructure, that's really what it is, fundamentally, the big block, it's about 110 meters long, it's lifted up on legs in the air over a road, analogous to a piece of the bridge or freeway or infrastructure, in some ways also going from nothing to nowhere. Next. This happens to be the headquarters for the digital design department of, of Kodak, which, which separates itself quite intentionally from the film department of Kodak, which it considers to be somewhat uh, less uh, progressive. Uh, but uh, building in the air over the road. And there are then anomalies, building lifted up on steel legs, and anomalies, one in the front at the point where you enter, uh, one in the back at the point where you exit. Next. Next, that first anomaly from above and from below. Next, and uh, in the lexicon of uh, 
the Gnostic book, The Inside of the Outside, that is up that entry stair next. And the, uh, uh, the road under the building going in, going out, legs missing, trucks exiting, next. And the second anomaly, uh, which is next. And looking the opposite way, bridge, pool, actually the water, there is no standing water in that pool, but the water flows out and, and sheet flows across the surface and is uh, pumped around again. Next. <coughs> And adjacent to that, this is, this is the Kodak building. And here, and here, uh, and uh, this is a project that just, uh, with a little assistance from Myrna Schnabel, among others, just went through, uh, was approved by the LA City Planning Commission uh, in March. Uh, it's two high-rise buildings, although I like the term city, I'm not so sure high-rise is, is, is a helpful, designation. Uh, one on the corner here, this is actually uh, a Jefferson. Jefferson, this is national and La Cienega is running here. The site is, is a critical site and a strange site and in some ways very typical of issues in Los Angeles. It's very central geographically. Uh, it, it adjoins La Cienega, which as you know runs north-south from, from uh, Sunset to LAX. Crossing that site laterally, Jefferson running from USC potentially to Santa Monica, and yet, and this is a separate subject which we don't discuss now, but very difficult to deal with the construction of this city and, and leave out the subject of race. Which is, which is, of course, fundamental to choices and organization, and I'm going to leave it out for the moment. Maybe we come back to it in, in, in the next uh, discussion. Uh, you want to back up on, can you back up on that? I wasn't quite uh, exhausted. Uh, <laughs> so the, as, as a hypothesis, as a location, as a piece of, of, of the geography of the city, which also adjoins the, the Santa Monica Freeway, the location seems like a plausible, prominent, burgeoning location for, for, uh, for activity. And what essentially is, is being proposed here are what probably could be uh, uh, classified as loft office space uh, with tenants doing film and, and video and advertising and all of this dot-com stuff which, which may have to be qualified at some point in the, in the next moment or two. What's interesting, uh, what's, what's unusual about the building is the floor-to-floor -floor height is about six meters. So this is probably double the conventional floor-to-floor uh, -floor height of a building. The floor size is also relatively small. It's about 1,200 meters, about 12,000 uh, square feet per floor, which is not tiny, but which is smaller than certainly what Tishman would advocate. The structural system, I, for those uh, in inclined in that direction, actually is a frame. There is a frame uh, within this, a grid, which deals with the live loads and the dead loads in the building. And then the lateral stuff, the wind and the earthquake, is, is taken by this uh, asymmetrical frame. The glass is also of some interest, although this is, this is an evolving uh, technical discussion. But as the sun moves around the building, the glass changes from clear uh, to a milky white. And that milky white surface, uh, uh, which is opaque, can be is a, a kind of privacy screen and can also be uh, projected on. Next, please. The language, the language of the curves actually originated at the time we did this installation at, at Eisenman's building in the Wexner about a year ago, uh, which is, and I assume you know it or know a bit about it, uh, but has to do with a discussion of the ubiquitous grid. This is the grid. I folded the grid. I bent the grid. I twisted the grid. I microwaved the grid. I ate the grid, all of, all of that. And, and this piece in that installation had something to do with trying to find in that neutrality of the grid, a private neutrality, admittedly, is a consequence of, of that architect and his work, 
to find a center in that and a language of center or a language of concentricity and this was about that about making a center about making a gathering point and that language is used here in an analogous but not identical way assuming the either the ubiquitous grid or the depersonal infrastructure and somehow a language arrives which suggests something quite different i'm certainly not naive enough to think that somebody would look at that building and immediately explain it as i've explained it but it is anyway part of the thinking and part of the understanding part of the separation of structural types and so on next uh, we we talked about the vertical frame two horizontal frames this is this is the Kodak condition uh, with the girders and the legs and the anomalies in that box this is another one which is done a couple of years ago for a firm called Pittard and Sullivan which is which is a multimedia advertising all of that with with two levels of anomaly one an existing series of trusses that supported a building that preceded this building on the site over which was positioned this grid or this frame uh tube columns and wide flange beams so an amalgamation of two things which which are never found together and couldn't be accounted for at least in terms of the conventional structural kinds of explanation for the choices of system and therefore it was of interest to me to find those two together and then to work out a kind of a kind of association not quite reconciliation but an exchange in that discussion of of those two really disparate and usually found separate systems and then another the the introduction of yet another piece a discrete piece which makes the lobby and the entrance and so on next uh, the this is the north side of the building come to be known as the roller coaster which is which is actually a connection of uh, a, a stairway connection uh, between various decks next please uh, this is really the Rashmanization of of uh, from from my vantage point of the roller coaster or the bridges and i think what it means is that that for me the process of understanding a building can never have to do with looking at it or seeing it from a single point of view and that what makes it what it is is to see this as you saw it, there there are four of these bridges all of which are different but to see those from the north elevation to see those from inside the building between these big blocks and then you can also see this from underneath from another skylight so you actually come to understand what this is from three vantage points to say nothing of the fourth which is strolling across the roller coaster next please uh, and 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 the entry this is uh, to hearken a little bit back to, to a misuse of, of Charles Darwin but a fossilization really an imprint of that shape in the exterior wall which also takes a piece of this block with it the entry uh, uh, in this area here next please and you can see the consequence of this original system I, for for those of you who understand this as 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 an act of allegiance to the discussion of preservation it really has nothing to do with that at all and in, uh, frankly and in fact what happened when we drew the building was that we anticipated the structural frame would be deposited over the wood but when the contractor came to construct it it turned out to be of course much easier to get the wood out of the way put the steel up and then put the wood back which is which is the way it was done so that the discussion is really the interrelationship of these disparate orders of space not so much that one is is saved and therefore for uh, belongs to a kind of prehistory i think from my point of view this is this is not so much the issue and you can see in a number of cases how these pieces have been amended over the entrance dealing with sun and things like that next please uh, somebody, somebody told me the other night that, uh, or quoted to me the other night, Adolf Loos, uh, remarking that if you could photograph uh, a building, if it could be communicated photographically, the architect had failed. Uh, 
I'm not so sure what what that means, but I, I'm reasonably certain this space is 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 not is not representable uh, photographically. Certainly not in a single photograph. But this is is the lobby or pieces of the lobby. There is a kind of transparency discussion here. Which you're up on a stair now, looking down to the reception desk behind. There's a conference space, a lot of which is 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 glazed. Uh, the, the programmatic notion, like the Reichstag discussion, which may be equally dubious in, 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 in current uh, architectural uh, reference, is that democracy is related to transparency, and that somehow a conference area or a legislative chamber into which one can see uh, allows a, a connection or a communication between those who are inside and those who are outside, uh, forestalls privacy, advocates openness, and I'm not so sure any of that is true. It may look that way. I'm not so sure that these people, when they have to make a decision, don't go out in the parking lot and decide and then go into the conference room and announce it. But there is, in a, in a, in a spatial sense, uh, an importance that has to do with one space connecting with another and being able to understand from different vantage points movement through the building. Anyway, next. Uh, this is, uh, it, there have been a lot of discussions in, in the last, uh, uh, I don't know, 50, 75 years about box, uh, the box, making the box and, and unboxing the box. And uh, there is a quote that always had an appeal, uh, appeal to me uh, from Lao Tzu, which was, which was about the square with no corners. Uh, if, you can, if you can draw the square with no corners, then, then you can understand what's, what's driving this, keeping in mind that I can't draw it either. But it, but it is a sense of, of something which is and is not the box, a kind of kinetic idea. Next, please done uh, three or four years ago. The color is, is of some importance. It's black, but it's not, it's not ubiquitous black or uniformly black. It has some white in it. So it, it suggests not only what it is, but again, movement to something else. It suggests what it's about, but it also suggests the alternative possibility. And if you wanted to say black and white covered the whole range, then by implication, it might suggest the range uh, of possibilities. Anyway, the, the surfaces are black, except uh, for the floor, uh, which is white, but after you walk on it, it will become black, uh, if the owner would stop cleaning it. Next. Uh, adjacent to which uh, is, is a conference center which has come to be, I think, misnamed, like some of these other projects, uh, uh, the Beehive. And I think if you look at it and, and you read the shape, then that nomenclature seems plausible. But uh, uh, what what the project is really about is not so much this particular shape, but a way to dance like the Argentinians and the Brazilians so that one could imagine any number of other shapes, but not only as an advocacy, but a technical me but with a technical mechanism, which, which is a way to make buildings dance. Next which has, has to do with tubes. I don't want to say bend, and I don't want to say the lights out. I don't want to say bend or fold, but the column is broken and reconnected so that the shape transforms. And as the shape transforms, that, that pos those positions are then fixed. And following that are, are the pipes, the beams, which move horizontally in a curvilinear way and connect, connect the columns. And then, and this, this we did a few years ago uh, for one of the uh, Rizzoli things, and just stuck in the Xerox machine and stretched it, which, which actually implied, again, it could be any number of other things, and certainly more diverse than this, but it needn't belong to the specifics of the program and the site that it literally represents at the moment. Next. Next. Uh, this 
trying to find a way, actually, to a, a, a term which, which allows me to discuss this. And, and it, it might be the Haussmannization of a very big industrial area, although, although not for reasons of, of trying to bring troops through the site. Uh, but it's a collection of, of, of five buildings which is under construction at the moment. And the montages, where are you? Uh, looking west and, and looking east. So there, there is an overlap. This is a building which comes to be known as the stealth. And this is a building that comes to be known as backslash and slash. And uh, not as an advocacy of violence or any of that. Somehow it, these, these names pop up. Uh, and, and again, slash and backslash, and then there's, there's a structure here and here that we'll talk about uh, briefly. Next, please. Uh, so the, the site under construction uh, looking east and uh, in the foreground, uh, this uh, building, which is uh, about, uh, I don't know, 315 feet long, uh, to dimensionally, to give you some sense, about 60 feet high, and forms an an entrance wall and a gate so you pass into this through a hole in this building which which uh, has come to be known as the stealth and a, a friend of mine who is an architect looked at it and said it kind of looks like the stealth and the name the, the name stuck uh, the difficulty with that for me is that that uh, it's not as if I looked at an airplane and said this is not so bad, let's make a building that looks like the airplane. I mean, there really is no association except after the fact, but this, this, this uh, in any case seems to be the current label for it. Uh, and beyond that, these two buildings that I mentioned, slash, backslash, the building that was originally done for the Philharmonic, and this, uh, a parking structure here under construction which holds uh, about 600 automobiles and with an office building on the top. Next. Uh, this is um, a, high, a map again. This is a hydrology map, actually. And this hole and this hole are this building and this building. And what actually was done was that the parking area and the drainage for the site were designed and essentially exaggerated or pulled so that the site yeah, becomes a number of plates that tip and tilt as you move, that's this area here, as you move across it. The, the, the hypothesis is that over a period of time, this will be vacated, the automobiles will be gone, they'll move back to this, and this will turn then into a public space with a very different use and, and uh, point of view. Next. Uh, and this is the uh, backslash under construction and, and the model. Uh, there, there probably is, uh, these are unusual buildings for, for me and for my office, and just very briefly to try and explain them. There, there, if, if one polarized points of view, which somewhere might, might come together, one could say that buildings are about almost everything or almost nothing, and those are vantage points that, that, that one could take, and I can imagine associating, and you can associate various architects with, with one or the other, uh, or both. Uh, most of the buildings that, that I think I've been involved in in the last five or 10 years probably come closer to almost everything. Uh, this is, this has, has a slightly different meaning. I think it's one inexorable gesture, and the gesture is actually quite clear. But to follow the consequences of it through, it's a cut, actually, it's a slice, and to see what it cuts, when it cuts the concrete, when it cuts the post, when it cuts the steel, when it cuts the rafter, all of that, it's relentless, but it's legible. Next. Next. And next. Uh. The, the plane that I'm disowning while showing it. Uh, this is, this is the, the, the site for the building. There was uh, what they call euphemistically some uh, remedial action on the site, which means that it, that it had to be cleaned, and it was. And the, and the cleaning of the site suggested at least a piece of the design of the building. Next, please 
which is which is actually a garden in that hole or or recess a garden that that uh, can can uh, can take about 550 seats some covered some in the open facing a stage which actually exists in the building behind with seats as needed so it can be used as a stage it can be used as a small theater and the montage of the building into that piece of the site that excavated piece of the site next uh, and uh, the, the study model from uh, from the north and from the south uh, there in conceptual terms in very basic terms there there was an idea going back to the beginning that this piece the three-sided piece and this piece the four-sided piece were legible in a Euclidean way as ends or as destinations or as beginnings and where you got into mischief or where the shenanigans took place was in the interim where the section is 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 everywhere different next please and you can see the uh, uh, the the evolution uh, in in form and and it evolves with a series of planes there are no hyperbolic surfaces uh, from three-sided to four and back uh, this this end you can see the the excavation the long span the truss kind of incidental and more happenstance structure in the center with the circulation and then the frame on the south end of the building next and under construction uh, from the north and then the back wall next next uh, at, at the back of, of the site is this uh, parking structure which, which holds about 600 cars and is positioned in such a way that, that this piece and this piece effectively block in a perceptual way most of this building so that one, what one reads in the process of moving through essentially this area in, in the parking structure which, which in a very fundamental way accounts for the shape uh, of the office building that sits on the top and then and then hangs down across the entry face these are the ramps in and these are the ramps out <coughs> next please and uh, a bit of the, the the sequence the uh, the original blocks are rectangular blocks and then the adjustment of those blocks down over the entrance and then the infilling of additional blocks and then the intervention of the height limit and finally actually quite a clear and open first floor uh, for that space that, that sits on the roof and then a, a discussion of the amalgamation of two blocks and, and the uh, elevator core that leads up to it in this, in this area here the glazing system which actually opens up to the north next uh, and then uh, the model, uh, later study model, and the, the, the heights of the columns there are this, are, are, are that point. So that the, the, the structure here is an extension in part uh, of, of the order of the parking structure, it just goes right up through the roof. Next. And looking up from the uh, fourth floor, uh, the office level toward the mezzanine and then the mezzanine uh, in the drawing next and from the garage roof and looking uh, at the entry point on the site next uh, the, the two paintings of, of Mark Rothko uh, some of whose work you may know and uh, the, the point that is important to me and I, I, I wanted to uh, share with you has to do with the language of this which is uh, uh, slightly Giacometti-ish perhaps but is recognizable still in a pictorial way in a more conventional representational way as opposed to this which is an entirely different discussion and without accounting for either one in detail I think what I what I wanted to call to your attention was the possibility of beginning to work and beginning to think and trying to move and finding the language of space inadequate at least the language that you know or the language that was handed to you 
inadequate to represent what you feel you need to represent and therefore the need to find something which is actually quite different and much more experimental and of which in the end you're really not sure but you're prepared to go and look anyway Rothko was next this is a site in Clerkenwell in London next to the center of what's called the city or the old Roman center and this is obviously although there's an association in, in, in certain ways with the LA and Culver City work I think what I said about about LA suggests that, that at least in the area that we're working we're working in nowhere it's not a prominent place it doesn't have a particular history of building or use or any of that this is this is in that context certainly not nowhere it's very much somewhere in the in the in the middle of, of a very powerful financial center this is Reuters here which is off the site Sotheby's was was in here until recently Razorfish is going in here uh, this is uh, the site from one vantage point and from Sotheby's building looking back the other way this little building over here is is being taken by Knoll as an office uh, and as a showroom so the site is this but it also includes that building next uh, there, there is in the brief, the planning brief, an obligatory connection or road that, that runs through the site and connects this street with this. And the, the program is, although there's some housing, there's some commercial, it's essentially, again, loft office space. And there are at least five designations of, of space types or forms. Um, let me go to the next. Next. Um, one is one is a block a hard block a rigid block which is which is this piece there are two of those uh, there's there's secondly a softer form which exists in four places and the softer form to some extent ameliorates the difference between a kind of existing Dickensian situation uh, and the new more rigid uh, spatial forms uh, then there's there's what's known as the coil which is this a media block which is that and the beginning of a 300 meter high uh, office tower next and the, the the beginning of a study of the soft piece the hard piece uh, the the media box on, on which or the underside of which is a projection space an open public space and you see through that space to the Sotheby's building and then an early study with the coil omnipresent of the tower next and the hard and the soft and the box and the coil and the tower next uh, to shift uh, gears a little bit. This was given to me a number of years ago uh, by uh, a professor of mine by the name of uh, Kenzo Tange who did uh, a study of the shrine in Kyoto called Issei which is a Taoist shrine goes back to uh, the seventh century uh, and is quite fascinating in terms of this this idea of centripetal and centrifugal are coming together and coming apart and essentially what happens is there's a site and a building is built and the building stands for 20 years and the building is taken down and rebuilt on the adjacent site identically and so the the, the project literally embodies a, a durability a consistency an eternality a fixity and simultaneously it carries the flux and the fluid and the change and the move and 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 all of that and in still a, in still a different place but also an area which is which is of some interest to me I'll have very little expertise in it but dancing Shiva uh, which which belongs I guess to the Hindus maybe it belongs to everyone now which is which is a kind of in in Western terms a, a kind of Dionysian spirit of coming apart so it's both related to taking things down but it's it's taking things down in order to put new things up 
So that energy, which is, which, is, which is very critical, communicated in that dance, never verbal, never verbal, never enunciated. It has only to do with moving and dancing. Next, please. Uh, this, is, this is an early study, and I think this may also have to do with, with moving and dancing, and is, is, is related to shapes which are not defined in a Euclidean way, and a question of what is the unit and by what, by what standards or strategy is the unit defined? Where does this end? Where does the next one start? There actually is a big parking structure in here of about 1,500 cars. Their office space is here in a theater for 1,200 people, a proscenium theater. The proscenium starts, so the, 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 the conventional order of theater starts to intervene in the midst of this pillow or cloud or marshmallow or whatever sort of useless nomenclature we try to apply to this in order to try to begin to understand what it might be and how it might work. Next. And from above there are actually two courts cut into that office space, the space being very deep and light being somewhat critical. And next. Uh, the, the, uh, a further iteration in that discussion, which, which now has to do with, with the discussion of that form, but now compressed, uh, this is in Oslo, uh, a, a proposal for an opera house done, done recently, but compressed with more conventional kinds of, of blocks, in this case glass, so that the glass actually to some extent deforms or shapes or orders or organize, imposes on uh, this this uh, configuration, which is an entity in a sense, uh, which which manifests itself in, in in a number of ways. Uh, I can't see this too clearly, but as a roof form with a ceiling form, which 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 uh, which diverges from the roof form, makes actually the acoustical roof of of a theater or a shape which actually encloses a theater, or in some cases, I think this is probably not so clear, where only a piece of this exists. Anyway, next. Uh, and, and the site and, and the development, I think, in a very conventional kind of explanation, an old city called Christiana, uh, a, a 17th century grid, uh, emigrating or immigrating to the site which is here shown upside down over here so the immigration of that order and then the movement of a very different kind of land form into the site and the building being actually an amalgamation of those two next next please and uh, the plan form of the site, and I think in most of these buildings, fairly consistently, the order of the plan uh, doesn't necessarily communicate the complexity of the space. So there, there is, I think, a, a clear logic to a movement, which is actually an elevated movement here over the water, moving straight through to an open air theater, which is here, or moving through and then up to a smaller theater or this way into the opera house. Next, please. And a view out uh, to the water and uh, various uh, vantage points from around the site. Next. Uh, the, the last uh, project that, that I wanted to uh, uh, discuss with you um, starts, starts with a score from uh, John Cage, whose, whose work has interested me for a while. Uh, a few years ago, I had a student who uh, went to, I guess it was a Beinecke library, but Xeroxed every score of, of John Cage, wrapped them up in a strange package and, and gave them to me, and, and, and this is one. And I think the, the fundamental question has to do, in, in the case of music and composition, with, with whether music is auditory or not, or whether it's a kind of intellectual exercise that is, much, is as much visual as it is auditory. If you've listened to John Cage, which is a tough thing to do sometimes, so you understand what I mean, but in any case, I think the question being raised is, what is music? And if one could ask that, one could also ask, and by the way, what is architecture? And this project, in, in a sense, 
uh, uh, joins joins that dialogue. The original program was was for the uh, Green Umbrella concert series uh, for the LA Philharmonic, which is a series that's been running about 12 years with experimental music, drawing very tiny audiences. And the assumption it runs in the Jap Japan American Theater downtown. And the assumption somehow was that if it moved to West Los Angeles, that, that uh, the, the attendance would pick up whatever the implications of that sociologically next time. Anyway, next. So we, we studied the box which, which held uh, the, the uh, concert hall seating and the possibilities then of using the umbrella uh, as a performance stage on the stairs, on the podium, with a bleacher system over here. And the questions also, this, this involved Essa Pekka, it involved Peter Sellers, involved a lot of people who are interested in experimental discussions of music. Some of these probably are more plausible, some less. There was a discussion about having musicians here and the audience here, therefore you could hear the music and not see it. All of, all of those were, were part of the original uh, a series of discussions and this in a very different way uh, or a different subject matter starting to dissect or analyze or, or, uh, or study the construction method for pieces which originally had among other concerns acoustic concerns so the, there is the steel there there is the sprayed concrete over pipes wood trusses and actually a glass canopy which covers the seating area where the musicians uh, were to sit and may still. Next. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is the construction as, as it finally developed, looking from the entry corner. This is the building you see as you enter the site underneath the stealth and the entry ramp here. Next, please. Next. Next and up that entry piece uh, into the main space, which has become a production, post-production facility. This now, the area under the umbrella, uh, becoming a conference video uh, meeting uh, area. Next, please. And the, the looking up into the, into the ceiling of that, this piece, obviously this and and the uh, question and I wouldn't present this as solved but I would present it more as an open discussion which which has to do with this steel system underneath this three inch pipe and then the spraying of the concrete on top of it and the interest both in in making that substructure available but elusive so that one has a sense of it that it's there on the other hand it's not so legible that it represents a kind of allegiance to the expression of structure and what tends to happen is that the pipes between joints are a little bit more legible and then at the joints uh, the the concrete or the gunite swallows uh, swallows the structure uh, underneath it next please uh, this, uh, this actually was, I, I think, a, a pivotal, I mean, there are always these, these kinds of things. It, it, it's interesting to me, I mean, having given this lecture uh, probably five times in the last uh, ten days, and, and uh, going, into, going into halls with students and faculty and people standing here by the day and by the week, parading work as if by magic, and all of these, all of these things happen, and 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 they don't, actually. I, there, there are all sorts of adventures and nuances, and and in some cases, very fundamental uh, difficulties. And in in the case of this project, there's 17 pieces of glass involved. There's slump glass. The glass is laminated. Uh, all of that. And with very sophisticated technical support with engineers, Swiss and French, which of course makes them impeccable. And then a fabricator, a, a fabricator uh, with, with many, many years of experience. And of course, and this, this I think implicates a lot of current discussions where people from different eras working in different media 
talk at cross purposes to each other, whether that finally is ameliorated and disappears over time as everyone starts to share the same medium. So this remains to be seen. But at least in this context, the, the, the fabricator looking at drawings which weren't the kind of information that he had worked from for 30 years. So a whole series of, of, of misunderstandings uh, taking place. And it looked at one point that, that we would fail, uh, that, it, that it wouldn't work. And I think whatever the magic of, of, of doing architecture and building buildings, in my sense somehow that we can work our way out of almost everything. And, and where, that, where that conviction comes from, I'm not so sure. But all of a sudden, face to face with, with something that started to look like it, it, it couldn't be done. And I don't know for, uh, I assume none of you have ever failed at anything, but when, when the prospect, when the prospect uh, confronts you, you actually don't know. I mean, if you, if you run a hundred meters in the dark and you, and you fall down after 10 or after 99, so it's not so clear whether you were close or whether you were far away, whether you almost made it and whether you didn't. And I guess we assumed all along that, that we were at 99. Although there are some people who came in who thought we were about at five. So uh, the, the, the difference between success and failure probably has to do with the, the dura not so much talent in a way, but durability, or tenacity, a willingness to, to, to insist when sometimes actually very difficult to insist. So the end of the story, which makes it all a very nice story, is that it was all taken down, it was reanalyzed, it was adjusted, uh, it was next, please. Uh, it, it went back up, uh, and, and in fact, the clips and the glass and, and, and everything seemed to work. What's, what also is of interest in this context is that I mentioned to you the, the slash and the backslash buildings as, as categorically almost nothing as opposed to a discussion of almost everything. In a discussion of almost everything, nobody here knows whether anything you see is in the right place. Nobody knows. And the fact of the matter is that there's not a single line in this construction that is where it was in the drawing as it was drawn. <laughs> Until I tell you that. You could say the, the, the tone of it or the attitude or the strategy or the tactic or <coughs> it's, it's strong enough, <coughs> powerful enough to compensate for that, but literally and specifically, everything moved to some extent. And, and this was also of some importance to us and to people, uh, very, very talented and very intelligent and very unusual people who were working together uh, trying, trying to solve this. Can we change it? Can we adjust it? Or is it, this is the way we said it was, don't touch it or that's it. And, and in the end, we decided to circumnavigate this, to adjust it, to modify it, enough to add and to subtract and, and to make it work. And I think the distinction, almost nothing, almost everything, that, that kind of, of dilemma or problem would absolutely be legible in, this, in, this, in the cut, in slash and backslash. And again, you don't know if I don't tell you. Next. And next, next. There's a biblical uh, admonition, uh, which I think is the title of this lecture, uh, which is through a glass darkly. And it has to do with the sense that uh, a little like this room that you never quite understand, that we never quite understand what the world is, where it goes, what it means, all of that. And one of, one of the things that occurred to me in working on the project and finally seeing it come to a conclusion is that it would be possible to look at buildings or to look at this building or to look at architecture possibly not as a see me or see mine or see this as a destination, as an object which is a destination, 
But to see it as an opening into something else, to open up the glass so it's not quite as dark, and therefore to understand architecture as an opening into something else, as an aperture or a new way of seeing not as a destination, but through to a different level of understanding. That's where you might find the Gnostic Magellan, maybe, whoever that is. Next. Thank you very much. Anyone want to doubt anything? <laughs> no? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>